So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Catherine Garforth from Garforth Education. And today I have the pleasure of being joined by Kim Lockhart, who is a French immersion teacher uh, specializing in special education uh, in the Ontario School Board. And today we're talking about the right to read inquiry and French language programs. Before we take a deep dive into this conversation, I do want to make sure that I highlight two of the recommendations from the report because um, they're important to recognize. And the first one is recommendation 46, where school boards should draw on internal expertise, educators, administrators, speech and language pathologists, and psychology staff who are knowledgeable about the science of reading for systematic and direct instruction in foundational reading and structured literacy approaches. The second one that I want to highlight is number 47, that board staff who advocate for the science of reading or other measures to improve outcomes for students with disabilities should never be set a subject to adverse consequences or reprisals. And that's really important because this is an important movement that we need to do for our students, but also be aware that Sometimes teachers who speak out get some repercussions and that's not fair because we're doing it for the students. That's who we have best interest at heart. And we're not doing this to shame other professionals. I think everybody is aware of the limitations of their teacher education programs that they've been part of and how we need to make that better making it better for future teachers is wonderful but we need to also consider the current teachers that had this information missing from their education and make it a safe place for them to learn more about how to have it so they can move forward and make sure that they're doing evidence-based practices so thank you for joining me kim do you want to say a little bit about yourself Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is fabulous that um, the OHRC reports recommendations are making its way to BC. And to be honest, BC has a little bit of a, a special place in my heart. My husband's from uh, Vancouver. So I think his mother-in-law may be, my mother-in-law may be tuning in later on. But um, I began my science of reading journey back in 2013, actually, quite a long time ago, when I, about a year after I got the role of SST, which is student support teacher in an elementary dual track school. So dual track meaning half English, half French. We are now an all immersion school. And I walked into the role of SST, having my AQ part one specialist, uh, spec ed, um, AQ course part two and my um, specialist and after about a year I realized I actually didn't know as much about teaching reading as I thought I knew and despite the small remediation groups that I was using the low ratio wasn't helping students progress I was I had the same tools in my toolbox that all the classroom teachers were using so I set out to do my Master of Education, and I did that here in Kingston, Ontario. And I specialized in supporting parents of students with reading difficulties in French immersion programs. Um, and that was a terrific experience. And I learned about evidence-based instruction and the importance of bringing that research into the classrooms, but also sharing that research and disseminating it with parents of students who are struggling to read, but I still didn't know how to actually teach kids how to read. So I embarked on my Orton Gillingham journey and I uh, took my Orton Gillingham uh, foundations course. I took the associate level course and I took my teach Orton Gillingham teacher training educator certificate. And I have since 2015 adapted um, a structured literacy approach in my French second language classrooms. Right. That's amazing. I mean, 
it's so wonderful to hear about teachers that take the time and spend their money <laughs> on these additional trainings because it's not cheap and unfortunately currently is not widely available in the professional development available to teachers within their boards and their ministries. So we're definitely trying to move that forward. Now, one of the main things I wanted to talk about today was how the Right to Read Inquiry, which is an amazing report and mm -hmm. uh, things that all ministries should take a look at, is that they did unfortunately have a little bit of uh, uh, error when they left out the French language school boards. So uh, they did not include the Association of School Boards of Public Schools of Ontario or the Franco-Ontarian Association of Catholic School Boards. And while this was an oversight and it's very important that we consider all students um, in all education programs, the recommendations from the report can be applied to French language programs. And this is something that we wanna go into a little bit further in today's discussion and sharing how teaching best practices or how the brain learns to read is universal for alphabetic languages. And while French and English are different, there are similarities between the two. So talking from a linguistic perspective or a reading science perspective, French and English are both morphophonemic languages. That mm -hmm. means the spelling relates to how the word sounds. So the, the phonemes or the phonics, which are the individual speech sounds of the language, but it also depends on the morphology. And morphology are base elements or aspects of the words that contribute to meaning. And this is where we get a lot of information about which vowel spelling patterns to use in our French words, whether it's a masculine or a feminine and plural. And students benefit from the explicit teaching of this so that we make sure that our students understand what situations these um, graphemes, which are the relationships between the letters and the sounds that they represent, are available. So even though the recommendations in the report don't specifically mention French language programs and the, the systems that they looked at, weren't looking at teaching French reading. If we look at the research out there on the science of reading or structured literacy, the same rules apply or the same recommendations apply. And one thing that's important to consider is that everything we're looking at when it comes to reading and teaching reading is informed these days by imaging studies of the brain. And one of the leaders in this area is Dr. Dehane, who lives just outside of Paris and that's where his lab is. So a lot of this research is looking at the brains of individuals who are speaking and reading French. He also mm -hmm. does have uh, individuals from other language groupings. And when we look at the brain imaging studies, we're seeing the same areas of the brain light up when we're reading. So we need to make sure that we make the connections into these areas of the brain. It's not just one area of the brain that we need for reading, it's several. And they're universal for alphabetic languages. So we need to make the connections and the recommendations in the report discuss how we can kind of chop out the current curricular uh, recommendations and goals, prescribed learning outcomes that are not helping students make these connections and actually preventing some students from becoming readers and make sure that we use strategies that are gonna help them make these connections. 
And it's the same for alphabetic languages and even ones that are character-based, these, these areas. So yes, I'm sorry there was the oversight uh, in the report and in the schools that were looked at, but we can't write off the importance of the recommendations and findings. So yeah. personally, I don't speak French. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I can't speak to teaching French explicitly and working on it from a practical perspective. And, and that's why I wanted you to come on and help us address those issues. So if we look at those recommendations, what are the ones that really stand out to you? Well, help? yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just going to quote something quickly from the uh, executive summary, just because I know that there was a bit of a prickly feeling um, when the French school boards were left out. And in the executive summary on page seven, they do recognize the fact they did not include um, the French school boards. Uh, it's the last paragraph, page seven. Although the increased primary focus was on English language boards and faculties of education, it also identified, a ch identified challenges related to French language education. Most inquiry findings and recommendations likely apply equally to French language education and the OHRC expects that the ministry and French boards will address and implement the recommendations as appropriate for students learning in French. And then just today, a couple of hours ago, or a few hours ago here in Ontario, um, you were probably still sleeping when this came out, um, the OHRC received a response from the Ontario Ministry of Education. And I'm just gonna read it on my phone here because I didn't memorize it. Um, so this statement came out early this morning and it says the Ministry of Education's response to the OHRC's recommendations include, and the first thing they say is aligning the elementary English and French language curricula with scientific evidence-based approaches that emphasize direct and systematic instruction and eliminate the three queuing system by September 23. So I was thrilled to read that because knowing what I know about evidence-based instruction, I just assumed that this applied to French language uh, classrooms as well, because if you know the alphabetic principle, you know that um, decoding strategies and skills are the same for the English language programs are, as they are the French language programs. And I often use an analogy when it comes to the science of reading, although my Orton Gillingham instruction was in English and I did the top 10 tools, uh, tools for reading course and that was in English. I also did the Big Dipper science of reading course and that was in English. But because the method of instruction wasn't in French, that doesn't mean that the, same, the strategies can be adapted to, to a French speaking um, environment. Um, also, I want to note that the OHRC, the reading process is complex, as you know. It is incredibly complex. If they had done an inquiry on all of the elements of the reading process and all of the different languages spoken in, in Ontario, nobody would have been able to read such a large document, even with a narrow scope of looking at early foundational literacy skills, reading skills, and they do admit and recognize that they looked at those foundational skills and not all of the other elements, it is still a document that has 157 recommendations. So I think it's really important for people to acknowledge the fact that this is a massive inquiry and acknowledge the fact that these strategies and recommendations do apply to, to the French language um, classrooms. So having said that, sorry, let me um, stop for a moment because I want to, I know that a lot of teachers are on this call, but there are parents on this call too. So I want to be cognizant that we're using a lot of jargon. So let's just take a moment to talk about things. So sure. when you mentioned the alphabetic principle, what is that? Yeah. So the alphabetic principle is the understanding that we have symbol, which we call letters. And with each symbol or couple of symbols, we have sounds. So language is fundamentally a spoken 
way of communicating. And for hundreds of thousands of years, spoken language has existed. But the writing system is much more recent. And our brains are, um, sorry, I'm going off topic a little bit, but our brains are wired. When we're born, our brains are wired to learn how to speak. And that's why we always say, you know, an immersion program is so wonderful because children learn to speak and understand in another language. However, the reading process, our brains are not wired to learn how to read naturally. It's reading is not a natural process. We have to rewire our brains and explicitly show students and teach students that there is sound symbol correspondence. And so um, English is a very complex language. It's not one letter has one sound. As we know, um, there are many different letters that make many different sounds. And I'm not gonna get into that today because we don't have time for that. But in French, the same holds true. We have letters and we have sounds and we have to explicitly teach students that these letters make certain sounds. And when blended together, they form syllables, they form words and attached to those words, we have spoken language and meaning attached to them. Yeah. Does that make sense? Definitely. And the other thing is explicit. And that's making sure that we don't leave it up to chance. Well, there are many wonderful aspects of a discovery or an inquiry based approach to teaching. It means that some students may miss out on important concepts. And when we're talking something as fundamental as reading, that we need our students to understand and have so they can succeed throughout the rest of their school career. We need to make sure they get it. Absolutely. And And we also have to, well, and sorry for jumping in. I get super excited and I'm sorry if I interrupt you, but we also have to make sure that this isn't just about reading. And the inquiry does acknowledge too, that writing is equally important. And I call it a bit of a seesaw approach. We want children to be able to decode the words on the page. That means peel the letter sounds off, peel the words off the page. That's the symbol sound correspondence. But we also wanna make sure that they can put those sounds onto paper. And that's the encoding or spelling process. We want them to be able to say, you know, I see a cat, how do you spell cat? And I use something called SOS spelling to help students with with, with their spelling or encoding strategies. And also, I just want to clarify, we use the word dyslexia a lot, but I want to clarify that dyslexia is not a visual disability. I think sometimes there's this idea or there's this myth that students who mix up the letters B and D, they must be dyslexic. I have two children uh, myself, they're 9 and 11 now, and when they were little and they were exploring with writing, they consistently mixed up the letters B and D. They are not dyslexic. Dyslexia is actually an, um, a difficult, it's an audio, auditory disability and students have a hard time discriminating sounds in words. They have a hard time hearing those individual sounds in words. So if I say, what's the first sound you hear in the word cat? They'll, they may say ca, or they may say cat. They don't hear the k and the a ah and the t. So um, those sound skills, or the word we use is uh, phonemic awareness skills, which fall under the umbrella of phonological awareness skills, are extremely important for students with dyslexia who have a hard time discriminating the fact that these words we're saying are actually made up of individual units of sound. And when one sound changes, it can drastically affect the meaning of a word. So if if, um, I say the word, oh, you know what, there was a cat in the house. Well, a cat is very different than a bat. And I might freak out if it's a bat, but just that one small sound can drastically affect the meaning of 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 a word. (laughs) I muted myself for a second. I'm sorry. Um, It is. And the other thing that I want to highlight is while this was focusing on students with dyslexia, it's not that these recommendations are only for students with dyslexia. It's actually best practices for every student in the classroom. When it comes to reading instruction and learning how to read. There is a range of 
ease that students are going to have. And yes, there's going to be maybe five to 10% of students who seem to make learning how to read almost effortless. And we don't really consider what they're getting at home before, but I have three children. Uh, I have a severely dyslexic child, uh, a child that needs a little bit of extra help and a child that's learning in preschool how to read. So um, it, it's, it's very interesting to see the different struggles and strengths that they've had growing up, but every student in the classroom can benefit from this instruction that's explicit and it's not going to hurt anyone. Whereas if we're using instructional methods that are leaving students out, there are long-term consequences for these students aside from not getting the skills for reading. There are mental health issues and things that are going to affect them, like the ability to get a job, the ability to read instructions, follow directions, and fill out job applications. Yes, there's a whole bunch of technology available, but that doesn't make it is accessible because there's a huge financial cost to all this assistive technology. And while it may be provided for the students while they are in school, afterwards, the public school system isn't paying for them to have, you know, a, a tablet or a smart film that they can make use of the assistive technology that they get access to in school. So it's a, it's a equality issue. But I think we're kind of veering off track a little bit. So let's try to refocus and talk about some of the, the foundational theories around reading that apply to both mm -hmm. French and English. And the first one, and it's been around since the 80s, that Sumner and Goff proposed was a simple view of reading. And I think that's a great place to start any conversation about um, reading because it's pretty easy to understand and that's why it's considered simple but it does it does highlight the complexities so when we talk about reading regardless of the language we're looking at they're often thinking about someone who can read something and understand information from what they're reading and learning from that that's what we're expecting our students to do especially once they get above grade four right that's right. if we look at the simple view of reading, it's a multiplication equation, right, that has two factors that are equally important. The first is word recognition, and that is the ability to recognize what the word says. And that's where a lot of the focus needs to be placed in the primary years. The second component is language comprehension, and that's their ability to understand language. And that's another thing that we need to focus on across schooling, but it doesn't need to be done at the same time. And so we need to make sure that the child has good language comprehension and good word recognition skills. And depending on their ability to do these skills, it's gonna impact their ability to understand what they're reading and learn from it. So if we say that the minimum value that one of these skills, word recognition or language comprehension can have is zero and the highest value is one, then in a perfect world, a kid will either have a zero or one, but in reality, it's not. And when you multiply a decimal by a decimal, it gets smaller. So even though you could have a student that has no problem with language comprehension, but they struggle with uh, the word recognition side of the equation, it's going to impact their ability to understand what they're reading because they're not able to read it and vice versa. And then you have the students that struggle with both. So as an educator or as a parent, it's important to be that detective to try and figure out what error or what area we're struggling with. And on Monday, I spoke with Jenny Gray of Watermelon Works, and we went into this a little bit more deeply as to the different areas when we're looking at, you know, the um, pure French school system. So when we're looking at French first language students, 
We looked at the early immersion students, the late immersion students and the core French students addressing how these students need different approaches to the reading instruction based on the knowledge that they come to the instruction with. So now the simple view of reading applies to any language, right? You need to be able to recognize the word in its symbolic form, whether that's letters or characters. And you need to be able to understand the language. Then you need to put that together and understand the words that you're reading to make sense. Now, those are pretty big concepts, but luckily in 2000s, or was it 2001, the reading rope came out? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so 2001, Hollis, Dr. Hollis Scholar Burrow came out with the reading rope. And this breaks down those components even further so that we can understand the different areas that we need to look at to understand what students need to have the additional support on. And again, these areas are just as applicable in any language, right? And yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've unpacked a lot in the last five minutes. I don't even know where to start right now. But, but you know, you hit the nail on the head many times in the last 10 minutes. Um, and that is one thing that unfortunately is not highlighted in the OHRC inquiry is the, important, in, is the importance of oral language skills um, because the inquiry is based on the majority of students coming from, I believe, English first language homes. So they're really targeting the word recognition skills. And back to what you said, the purpose of reading is to comprehend what we read. And so the simple view of reading, whether we're looking at an English or a French immersion classroom, is word recognition, which is reading those words off the page, which we call decoding skills, and also language comprehension, which is understanding and attaching meaning to those words. And I'm going to give a quick little personal story here for anyone who doesn't can't picture the simple view of reading. So I started my career in Mexico. I graduated from Queens um, Faculty of Education and applied to the uh, American School Foundation of Monterey, Mexico. And I went there for three years. And other than teaching grade two uh, ESL, I also really wanted to learn Spanish. And I became a beautiful reader in Spanish. It is a very, for anyone who knows Spanish, it's a very phonetic language. So basically one letter, one sound, not like English where one letter can make multiple sounds. And I remember coming home at Christmas and I could read a passage, no problem. And I remember my dad who has zero Spanish said, Kimberly, you are a beautiful reader. What were you reading? Now I said, I have no idea. I sounded like I could read it, but I didn't have the language comprehension. I hadn't lived there long enough to be able to understand what I was reading. So I could decode these words. I could read these words. I could, you know, put on the accent, but I had no language comprehension. So I could not attain reading comprehension because I didn't have the language comprehension piece, though I could decode. So what I'm finding in French immersion programs right now, and I can only speak to French immersion because I don't work in a French first language school is, um, we have put a lot of focus and attention on PA, which is the sound skills and phonics. And what's happening, what I'm seeing is we're getting some really good decoders. We're, I'm seeing a lot of kids being able to peel those words off the page. They are reading, but they don't have the language comprehension piece. And, and that is a piece of the puzzle that is essential. So the Ontario Human Rights Inquiry put a lot of focus on that um, word recognition piece, but we really need to make sure that in French immersion classrooms, we put equal emphasis on the vocabulary, explicit in, uh, systematic instruction of vocabulary. We want them, we want to grow their vocabulary. So when they're decoding and reading words off a page, they can, you know, create that visual in their heads. So I feel a little bit like in French immersion, and again, I can only speak to what's going on in my classroom and in my school, we have put so much time and energy into helping kids decode, we can't drop the other balls. You know, the reading process, I, I see it as a, a puzzle. 
and where there are many different pieces of the puzzle. And you were talking about morphology and we have etymology and understanding the origin of words to know how to spell them because that comes from their etymological or etymology, the, the origin of their, um, where they originated. But we also have fluency. We have listening comprehension. We have vocabulary development. We need all of those pieces. So we can't just, structured literacy is not just about phonics. It is about keeping all of those pieces in the puzzle and we need to fit them all together in order to have a full structured literacy reading program. And that can you know, apply to, to French as well. We can't just focus on the phonics. We can't just focus on the sound skills. We need to um, teach the vocabulary piece. We need to model fluency and teach kids to read fluently so that they're no longer putting all their time and energy trying to decode those words. They're actually decoding quite easily and now reading for meaning. But if they don't know what those sounds are, they're not going to be able to attach meaning to them. Yeah, well, and I, and I think an important thing to address is the importance of not teaching these skills in isolation. Exactly. Right? So when we're teaching, you know, the phonemic awareness or the awareness of the sound within the spoken language, we need to make sure that we're also, when it's appropriate, tying the uh, letter sound relationship or the grapheme phoneme correspondences to these and we need to get away from the idea, especially in the early years, of just doing, you know, an alphabet introduction, right? And focusing on, you know, words that begin with the ah sound, right? Or the b sound. And it's not b, exactly. but right? we need to be very- We don't want that schwa. We don't want to feel it. We don't want that schwa on there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But- so we need to figure out those sound walls and the, instead of a word wall, have it so that it's associating the sounds of the onset or that first sound in the word, and then explicitly teaching or making sure you're intentional in your teaching of the graphemes or the letter that represents that sound, letters. So there isn't just that one sound to one letter right? That's right. We have digraphs, trigraphs, quadraphs, and even five letters that represent one sound exactly. in the language. So we need to make students aware of these. And I, I mean, I can only speak to French immersion programs because that's what I have exposure to with my children. But there are some great French dictate programs out there that do have that explicit teaching of the vowel sounds however it's just that yes it doesn't take it further i mean there is a little bit of comprehension scaffold it into it but we're not seeing a lot of the classrooms include those decodable texts which are controlled texts the words that are chosen in the stories are very um well thought out so we make sure that the students have the skills to figure out what the words say based on their phonics knowledge or their understanding of what the letters represent in sounds and how to put those together. Instead of having these predictable texts where kids don't even have to look at the words, they can look at the pictures to figure out what it's going to say. Well, and can I jump in there? Again, you've just unpacked a whole bunch of things that I'd love to jump on, but I'm going to jump on that point right now because I have been using a structured literacy, you know, research-based approach to reading instruction for a number of years now. However, the assessments aren't aligning with the instruction. And so um, in my school board, a few of us, and I'm talking about a handful of people, are using a structured literacy approach in an FSL classroom. Now we have more teachers embracing structured literacy in the English classrooms. We have some literacy champions here in Kingston, Ontario, but there are not a lot of us who are using this approach to reading instruction in FSL. We have this mindset still that students who are struggling in French immersion maybe aren't just aren't cut out for it. So we need to make sure that we, we change that mindset, but also 
um, to your point of, of resources, we need to make sure that there is more consistency in the resources that are available. Because if you don't have any knowledge of the science of reading, if you are brand new to the game, the first thing you're going to want to do is find that golden ticket. You're going to want to spend your funding on a resource so you can throw in that structured literacy approach. But structured literacy isn't something you can just go and buy. And so I really want this audience to understand that there is no one resource out there that will give you everything you need and it won't give you everything your students need. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there but they are not the magic ticket to teaching your, your kids to read. I always say resources don't teach children to read, knowledgeable teachers teach children how to read. And so having said that, I do think it is important that the Ministry of Ontario provides teachers with, first of all, training in a research-based um, screeners and assessments because a lot of them are homemade in our school boards. Um, I, I've spoken to many different people across Ontario and we are all using different screeners. We're using different assessments. Some people are using JB Plus, some are using them from the Northeastern Catholic District School Board. I don't even know where that is. Um, some of them are finding them on Teachers Pay Teachers. Some of them are finding them on Madame Jardin on Pinterest. And so right now we have a hodgepodge of different um, resources, screeners and assessments that we are using and essentially none of them are research-based. So I think teachers are desperate. Um, maybe I'm speaking too generally, but I know a lot of teachers who will come to me and say, tell me what to use. And so I just want to say that I have recently been exploring Edapel, which is um, the French version of Acadians. And Acadians used to be, um, oh, Una's on here. Una's, I wish Una could jump in. She can explain this better than I can. But um, so Dibbles was first introduced to me in my Orton Gillingham training. And I was like, what is this magical screening uh, tool? But through my Orton Gillingham, I found that it was just more than I could take in at the time. I was focused on reading interventions and then trying to adapt them to my FSL classroom. And then this year I became very frustrated with the assessments that we were using because my kids were reading. My kids, my FSL kids were reading and then I had to give them this book and this to, to assess them. And in this book, it said, voici un, and it had a picture of a swing set. And anyone in the audience here who speaks French knows that the word for swing set is Balançoire. So first of all, my little guys in grade one didn't know the word for swing set. So looking at the swing set, they were like, that's a swing set. But A, they were taking their eyes off the letters and off the word and looking at the picture. And B, they didn't have the lexicon. They didn't have the vocabulary to guess the word. So I decided to look into uh, research-based assessments. And I feel like the Ontario Ministry of Education needs to put money into A, teacher training of these screeners and assessments, and B, making sure that they are available to all teachers so we don't have to rely on Pinterest and teachers pay teachers and um, essentially guess what our students' reading level is and, second, and, and, and guess what the interventions are. Because if I tell you um, Catherine, you have children in FSL. If I tell you, oh, you know, I'm really sorry, but your daughter's reading at a JV plus C, you're like, is that good or bad? You know? And so that really doesn't tell me anything. It's it's so abstract. Whereas if we use Acadians or if we use Edapel, it tells us targeted areas that the child is struggling with and more importantly, which areas to target for the reading interventions. So is it phonological awareness? Is it phonemic awareness skills? Are they having a hard time with those sound skills, beginning sounds, ending sounds, blending? Is it the phonics that they're having a hard time with? Is it the, the, the decoding of um, nonsense words? Because then we need to go back to the phonics. So I would, in my perfect world, I would love to see the Ministry of Education invest in teacher training for, for um, 
universal screeners here in Ontario and in BC too. Everywhere in the world. No, no, we don't need to tie it just to Canada. (laughs) And the States is doing a good job though. Yeah. Yeah, they are. But it shouldn't be up to lottery, which child gets the teacher that understands us and which child doesn't. There are, there is so many, um, you know, tutoring programs, storefronts in a lot of areas that we see, you know, some of these quote unquote well-off communities that have really good schools, but then you see five or six tutoring centers that offer this instruction that the kids aren't getting in school and it's skewing the results. Well, and it's not available in French. I don't know about you in Vancouver, but we have a wonderful uh, place here, private and extremely expensive, that a structured literacy approach, but in English. So what I'm seeing is those kids just start soaring, Mm -hmm. um, whereas the kids who don't have access to it, you know, are still a bit of at a standpoint. And, you know, as a tier two teacher myself, I have very, very, very limited time with these students in the SST groups. What I'm trying to do right now is to, I call it bring the magic, and it's getting a little tired, that term, but I try to bring the structured literacy magic into the classrooms and and show teachers how to implement and what does it look like? Because it's one thing for me to sit here and tell you, well, Catherine, you start with visual drills and then you do an auditory drill and then you do a blending drill and then you introduce a new sound and concept and you're like, whoa, but what does that look like? And more importantly, what do the, what are the other kids doing? You know, like Kim, you, you're telling me to do tier two with three kids who are struggling. What are the other 24 kids in my classroom doing? So they're right. It's not easy. And if you're used to teaching to the whole class and whole group, and I'm now saying, well, actually those little strugglies, bring them aside. And this is what you do with the other kids. And so I try to practice what I preach a little bit. You know, I'm talking about a multi-sensory approach with my students. I try to take a multi-sensory approach with, with the training too. And, and not just telling people how to do it, but showing people how to do it. Is it tricky? Everything's hard when you, when you like anything that's unfamiliar is challenging, but honestly, at the end of the day, structured literacy has made my life easier because there is a routine. There is structure. The kids know what to expect. I work with them for 15 minutes. They come in, they're ready to go. They have their code packs out. They're ready to go. Then they start blending. Then they use their sky grass ground. And in 15 minutes, we can do a lot. Was it messy at the beginning when I was trying to get them into the routine? Absolutely. Now, eight weeks into the reading remediation, are they, you know, doing well? They love it. They just love it. And, and they look forward to it. And, um, and they're learning. Most importantly, they're learning. Well, and on Friday, we have another conversation where we're actually going into more detail on what you do in that time. So yes. that's, that's a great opportunity to, you know, see what it, exactly it looks like. And, you know, I think we need to take a moment to talk about what currently curriculums or teachers are learning. And that's mm-hmm. more of a whole language or a balanced literacy approach, which be, started becoming popular in more like early beginning, starting about the 70s, 1970s where it's like, you know what, if we just give children exposure to this and get them to have a love of reading and language yeah. and we get them to you know, explore it and experiment with it, then they're gonna pick it up naturally. Well, as someone who didn't, <laughs> um, it, it, it's not the right thing. And when we look at the research, only about 40% of our students are gonna become fluent, adequate, skilled readers with that approach. So what this report is really highlighting is that we need to reassess. We need to make sure that we have best practices in place so we can get a higher percentage of these students reading the first time that we teach them. And right now, 
I feel that, you know, if you're familiar with an RTI or a tiered approach to teaching, you, you yes. kind of see a, a triangle, right? And the bottom is the uh, first whole class thing that everybody's getting. And then in the middle, you have the tier two or the small group intervention. And then tier one is those students that really need that extra support, right? They need that one-on-one -on -one intervention. And right now, I feel like the angle at the top of the triangle is acute, right? Yes. So it's pretty small and it's a very steep triangle where there's, you know, we're getting maybe 30% on the bottom, maybe 40% on the bottom, but we need to make that angle obtuse, right? It's so working like this. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to make that bottom tier one stuff obtuse. So we're getting 70% of the students reading with that classroom instruction. And when we follow the recommendations in the report, we're going to see that getting that um, the angle of the apex a lot wider. So there's less of a demand for that tier two support or that small group support. So we can really focus on those kids that need it explicit repeatedly over and over again. One thing that we haven't really talked about is fluent reading. And that's mm -hmm. the able, ability to read the text without much effort, with the right prosody and expression, paying attention to punctuation. To get there, you need to have the word in your site vocabulary or orthographically mapped so that you can recognize it within a fraction of a second. And to do that, some students need repeated exposures of the same concepts and the same words before they can have it. So it's just there for them. And we need to make sure that we can provide that support. And it is effective in those small group settings, but we need to have those groups actually small and not 10 students. We need Absolutely. to focus on those, you know, three to five students instead of 10 students where the other five in that group, if they had the direct explicit instruction in the classroom, they would have been fine, yeah. right? And, you know, a lot of complaints that we see in the school system are money, time, and resources. Well, the amount of money it takes to intervene for a student is huge. We're talking about thousands of dollars. In a long period of time. In a long period of time. The amount of money it takes to get a, form, a formal diagnosis of a specific learning disorder is very expensive. And schools only have a few each year, if they're lucky, that they can do on their entire student body. Some kids are fortunate and their parents can afford to pay for those assessments that go for, I mean, 3500 not high price for them anymore that's a lot of money and, and then, then for what at the end of the day exactly does that change but, anything that's going on in the classroom no but with this shift if we do that early screening thing, that can happen in junior k or in preschool depending on where you live you can do a 10 15 minute screener on those kids before they start learning how to read to identify the areas that they're struggling in can, can they, you know, tell you what the letters of the alphabet are? Can they enter by them? Well, if they know, we need to get that automatic. We need to make it so they don't have to think about it. We need to make it so that when they're printing, they don't have to think about how to form the letter so that they have the correct formation of how to create that letter, top, down, left, right. That's how we form our letters. But in the classroom, we're with the discovery inquiry base, we're not having that same explicit instruction. So you see the students struggling and when they're reading or when they're printing and writing, they're having to stop and think how to form the letter and they do it, they can do it in an awkward manner. So it's difficult for them. Once we get this intervention or to the place where we can screen these kids early, provide that support on the phonological and phonemic awareness, which is those awareness of the speech sounds within the spoken language, 
that they are going to need. And I want to highlight that kids who can comprehend language, regardless of the language, if they can comprehend it, they have an unconscious awareness of phonological awareness or the speech sounds within language. When we go to phonemic awareness, that's, it exists. It is a real thing, but it's not a concrete thing. And while some kids figure it out, I mean, if you're a parent, I'm sure you experience where kids are able to separate things into syllables very easily, unconsciously. Mommy, daddy, like they can do that. But when we're teaching them, we need to bring that unconscious awareness into conscious awareness so they can figure it out and understand it. And then go to that next level where they learn that we can represent those sounds by symbols and letters. And when we do that, we can communicate with each other and not be in the same place and not hearing it. So this is the magic that we wanna give all of our students. And with that early screening process mm -hmm. that is quick, it is efficient, it is prescriptive. So we don't wanna just have someone parachute in, do it, have the numbers in the spreadsheet and forget about it. Use the data. Really, if the teacher can go in, do it, have that external support. And instead of having the parachute person jumping in to do the testing, coming in to read a book with the students, you know, do an art craft or a creative activity that the classroom teacher can pull them out, quickly do it, understand what each student needs in their class, make those small group tier two supports for the students that need it and recognize that, okay, there are gonna be a couple of kids that are gonna need that higher level. Well, save the time for the speech and language pathologist, the occupational therapist, the school psychologist, who has the higher knowledge, ideally, and expertise to provide mm -hmm. the support. Because there are limitations as a teacher. Believe it or not, every teacher has the same 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 365 days in a year. And you may not know this, but they do have a life outside of school, <laughs> right? Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah life outside of school and have their own self-care and not have to focus in on every sitting. So what we really need to do, and I think the right to read public inquiry report and recommendations does address this well, is make sure we provide the support to the teachers. We provide the training to the teachers. We provide the resources to the teachers so that we can reduce their load and not have the, the burden on them to go out, scramble and find them because it's difficult, it's hard, it's exhausting, it's expensive. We need to say, look, here, we know what you need to know. Here it is, take it. Here are the tools that you need for your students to learn how to read. This is the tier one support. This is the tier two support. And this is the tier three support that we're going to have. And you know what? I'm not going to make you scour the internet for it. It's right here. How can I help you with this? What can we do as a board, as a district, as a ministry to support your journey along this way? And realizing that it's not going to be an instantaneous thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you said you started this journey in 2013. It's not something that you pick up overnight. And I'm not done. Well, exactly. And you're the never done. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I have yet to learn. Well, and it's very easy to fall into that trap of seeing a book club here and a book club there, and then ending up with your Amazon cart full of books that you want to buy. And then you eventually buy them. And then you have a stack, you know, on your bookshelf or your bedside table. And you're like, oh, I really need to read those. But the language in some of them, like they're amazing books. But if you look even at... Um, Oh, what's um, Seidenberg's Language at the Speed of Sight? Yes. Yeah. That's a heavy read. That's a heavy read. And it's, it's amazing. Big... It has wonderful information. But a teacher. You don't want to start with that, though. No, you don't. You start don't want to start that. with that. No. No. Or even reading in the brain or yeah, letters or a, yeah. a speech to print. There are, there are concepts that, yes, are essential for you to learn, but you need to do it in a step by step logical manner. And it's 
asking the districts, the ministries, and the higher ups, the teacher education programs to make sure that's there from the beginning and helping support the teachers that are at various stages in their career get it and not having those roadblocks and obstacles. Well, and, and I, I love that you're mentioning this because one of the things I wanted to finish this chat with was some takeaways because I feel sometimes we tell teachers, this is important. We're raising your awareness. And they're like, great, I'm super aware, but now what? So, you know, one of the ways I started my, my journey with the science of reading was to read some of the research. And you don't have to pay to do that. There are a lot of free articles. Um, this is one that I would highly recommend. It is by Louise Fierce Whirling. Um, and it's called Structured Literacy and Typical Literacy Practices. This one is also available in French. If you are um, more comfortable reading it in French, it doesn't matter if the text is in English or French, the concept and the meat and the, what they're trying to convey is the same. Um, this is found on the uh, International Dyslexia Association of Ontario's website under the French resource section. The English one is obviously not under the French resource section, but also um, another great place to start if you're new to the science of reading journey is Teaching Reading is Rocket Science by Louisa Motes. Uh, Catherine just mentioned uh, reading, um, print, a, no, not speech, to print. speech to print. Um, she is the author of Speech to Print. This is a very user-friendly, easy to read article, and I'd recommend that. If you are watching the replay of this video, uh, if you're watching it on YouTube, it the links to these documents will be in the comment section. If you are watching it on www.righttoreadinitiative.com, then if you look below this video, you are gonna see links to these resources. I would also highly recommend reading Educator Training Initiatives Brief, Structured Literacy and Introductory Guide. So you don't have to do an MED to learn about the science of reading. There is a lot uh, of great stuff online. Um, I have also- Literally A lot of the MED programs and the NM MA programs don't even include this in their courses. Oh no, I didn't learn, I didn't learn this in my MED program. I learned this on my own, uh, on my own time. Um, you mentioned book clubs popping up everywhere. Our last book club was uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we, we read the book, Know Better, Do Better. And our book club here in Kingston is 50% English teachers and 50% FSL teachers. Now, the FSL teachers are reading the books in English, but then we break off into two breakout rooms. And we have a guest speaker, or sometimes myself, depending on what the theme is, who um, facilitates the discussion of the book in French for the English group and in, or sorry, French for the French group and English for the English group. And the theme of the last book club was MTSS and the multi-tiered systems of support. So, you know, these books can lend themselves to some, some great discussion. Um, the one that we're reading right now is Brain Words. And it's by uh, Richard Gentry and Jean Ouellette. Um, and um, I would also highly recommend Structured Literacy Interventions. Now, this one is Structured Literacy Interventions, but going back to what Catherine said, a structured literacy approach is so important. It's essential in the regular classroom. And I use Structured Literacy Approach in the regular classroom um, as part of my, as part of my literacy program, but the book clubs really are a wonderful way to learn about the science of reading. You can collaborate with colleagues. I have a bit of a thorn in my side about all the collaborative inquiry groups that we've had in the last seven years. And it's just, um, it's like a closed circuit. There are this, the same people with the same questions it, and you end up leaving with no answers. So in the book club, we try to bring in an expert and um, because I feel like the only way we are going to increase our knowledge is by learning from those people who are experts in the field. And teachers are um, really eager to learn 
about the science of reading. So we've been trying to include some speech and language pathologists. Una Malcolm came to our last one with her colleague, Nellie Caruso. Uh, Nellie Caruso is currently doing a uh, universal um, screener. She's using Edipel and has been implementing it in her grade two French immersion classroom and has had seen some great success. So I feel that it's so important to not just have these, first of all, don't you don't have to learn alone. There are a lot of people who want to learn with you, um, read the articles together, talk about them, and, you know, always ask questions, um, you know, learn from the experts, because we're not reinventing the wheel. Like Catherine said, the simple view of reading has been around since 1986. There are, we're, we're working in silos. The researchers are working in silos, and the teachers are working in silos, and we need to bridge that gap between what's happening in research and what's happening in the classrooms because the researchers are frustrated that they have this knowledge and it's not making its way into the classrooms and the teachers are frustrated all these kids who can't read and the information is there we just need to start bridging those gaps yes of course and um if you can quickly type in the chat the the edipel it's actually I'm going to say, um, look on the, whatever, put it in the chat. Um, <laughs> and so thank you for everyone who have joined this conversation live. I think it's really important that we make sure everything in this right to read public inquiry is addressed and we keep it going. So we create that avalanche right so that people have to listen and we have to create these changes i would love to invite anyone to join me on just a connection call to see about how we can take this to that next level and anything that you can provide or if you are having questions i know um i haven't been able to answer the q a questions kim if you want to quickly read Isabel's question under the Q&A okay. tab. Okay, hold on. That hold on. would be great. I'm not very good at French screen managing the chat while having the conversation at the same time. I'm sorry about that limitation. Um, the French screening tool is Edipel. Mm -hmm. And I will send a list to Catherine of the, we have had 10 books in our Science of Reading book club uh, this year. And I have just uh, vetted a list of 10 books for, for next year. So I'll send those to you as well as the articles that we have included. And also, Catherine, I have um, a list of some amazing podcasts and you were talking an hour ago about um, the brain imaging. And if you're interested in knowing more about brain imaging but you don't have a neuroscience background, that's fine. Nadine Gab is also phenomenal. And I highly recommend listening to Nadine Gad's um, interview on Amplify. Uh, Amplify is the podcast and she is fantastic. She speaks in layman's terms and whatever she says, it just makes sense. So I would highly recommend Nadine Gab. How will this inquiry help older students in middle? That's a great question. I listened to another podcast yesterday about talking about how to support middle and older students. And the answer, I wish it was, you know, more complex than this, but regardless of the age of the child, they still need the same explicit systematic instruction um, that early readers need. If, if you've missed that opportunity in grade one, two, and three, they're going to have to, the only way to catch up is learning the code. Um, and I know that a lot of people have difficulties presenting a decodable book, not a leveled reader, but a decodable book to um, students, but there are some decodable books that have been developed for middle school age students, so they're not so baby. Well, and we need to go back and look at, you know, the Scarborough's Reading Rope, the simple view of reading, and see how it affects those higher uh, grade students, because the problem still exists with the phonological awareness, the, uh, the naming fluency, the ability to orthographically map or have that automaticity of recognizing words. And when we get to older students, there are more strands that we need to consider in the reading rope because we're demanding more from them. 
Now, when we're looking at students that are in those intermediate grades where they're doing that reading to learn, we also need to consider accommodations. So things that we can do to make sure they say, still have access to the education that their peers are getting, but getting it in a way that they can do this. So one of those things is having audiobooks or something that will take the text and read it aloud to it. One app is Speechify and it's free and you can get Speechify to read you French text. This makes it so we don't need to worry about that word recognition side of the equation. And we can focus purely on the language comprehension side of the equation. Now, when we're working on core subjects and that's the focus of the lesson, we wanna make sure we give them access to that. When they are using these, we need to make sure that schools are still providing those foundational skill support. So just because a student has access to audiobooks doesn't mean we can forget about working on the phonemic awareness, the phonological awareness and the phonics knowledge so that they do get the school, the skills to decode. Um, and you also need to look at the question and answer. So I'll read out actually. So Isabel's asking in the report, how much of the emphasis was put on the importance of working from speech to print rather than the other way around? What is the impact of the importance of speech to print approach with students who are language learners? Are the parts of the report that address English language learners that we can apply to French language learners? Yes, there are. And the, the thing to highlight when we're looking at any language learner is we need to recognize the phonemes available in their first language and recognize whether they are different than English and understand the graph. So if it's a Roman alphabetic language using the same alphabet that we use, do the letters represent the same sounds? So for example, in Spanish, the J does not say J, it says Y, right? In French, the letter H doesn't say H. Huh. So we need to make that explicit and say, okay, well, if, if you can read in another language, what does that look like? We need to make sure that if they are have had exposure to literacy instruction in another language, what does that look like and what can they do in that language? Because a lot of these skills are at the, at the word reading level, if they struggle in one language, they're going to struggle in another language, especially when it comes to things like phonemic awareness and phonological awareness that's considered to be a transferable skill. So if you have issues in your first language, you're gonna have issues in subsequent languages. If we're able to provide that support in the first language, it's gonna have the ability to help transfer to second languages for the phonemes that are the same amongst the language. So if I, so one of the skills that we spoke about earlier is the ability to blend, sorry, to segment a word into its individual phonemes. So if I can know that cat is k at, and I know that shot is cat, and I can go sh at, then it's the same skill. And if I can do it in French, I can do it in English and vice versa, as long as I understand the phonemes, right? And then we need to make sure that when we're doing this and we're working with words, and luckily when we're working on the beginning phonemic awareness skills, like the blending and segmenting, we're working on words that are one syllable. And they either have a vowel consonant or a consonant vowel consonant structure. Um, and these are skills that when we're teaching them, like, so if you're working on, um, so when we're teaching phonics, we wanna have a scope and sequence. 
We don't want to teach all the letters at once. And we want to have a logical progression through the letters that we're teaching. So one of the common scope and sequence starts out with the first six letters in English of S-A-T-P-I-N. So when you work on those six letters first, there are over 40 words that are in the vocabulary of a beginning reader that you can sound out and you can help them learn how to encode or print those words. So if I start out and saying, good morning guys, let's stretch out those sounds in the word sat. So it's sat. All right, what makes the S sound? Remember we've covered these letters and then you know, they have their little whiteboards or whatever and they represent or they, uh, do the letter S and then, okay, ah, the sound is that A, great, let's write that A, T, T, the, the, some of the stop consonants are the ones that um, you, you can't con make continuous, like you're not, T, 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 T. it's T, and then, okay, that's a T, great, so let's sound it up, sat, sat, right, so you can incorporate that into your lessons and making sure that you're not doing it in isolation because you need to build that bridge so they understand that this isn't just an activity that we do at the beginning of class. We're actually using it along the way. As they get better at this, and again, sorry, I'm using English examples. I am not a French speaker with any level of <laughs> proficiency uh, and I'm more comfortable doing this in English so then we can start saying okay well how many sounds do you hear in the word um pant let's count them P -a -n -t. okay so on our whiteboard we're going to draw three little dots to represent that we have four sounds in that word and we need to make sure that we have at least one letter representing each of those sounds. So the first one, p, what makes the p sound? Okay, that's the letter P. And then what about that ah sound? How do we represent the letter ah? We do that with A. And then n, t, and then let's make sure, do we have the number of letters to represent each number of the sounds. Great, awesome, that's great work. The other thing when we come to phonics instruction is realizing that there are those digraphs and making sure that that's explicit from the beginning. We're not just doing single letters that represent single sounds. We're having, again, like the CH, making the ch sound or the sh sound in French. And we're teaching that because that's a, a sound that they're going to be coming across. Like, for example, the chat, right? It's not C-A-T, it's C-H-A-T, isn't it? Yeah, getting that right? Sorry, I'm responding to uh, Sorry. questions in the chat. I wasn't sure if you were chatting to me and I'm just answering some questions in the chat. Sorry. Uh, both, but I'm just making sure that chat is C-H-A-T? Correct. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, again, French is not a strong point for me. But anyways, I think we've covered a, uh, yes, we've covered a lot. And you did highlight that the phonological awareness is cross linguist but phonics is not. However, many of the consonants of are. The consonant sounds are. It's the vowel digraph, sorry, the vowel sounds and the graphemes that represent them. That's where it gets tricky. There are, so there is some overlap with the mm -hmm. fonts, but they are essentially learning two codes um, and that can be tricky. And so I know we have this big push for inclusion in French immersion, but I do want to dispel the myth that um, kids don't learn to read through an immersion process. And, you know, like I said at the very beginning, learning language, spoken language is a natural process, but kids who are struggling to read, will not learn to read in French without explicit systematic instruction, the same thing they would require in the English language program. So I always 
reiterate the difference between a bilingual program and a biliterate program. And I ask parents, what is your goal? If your goal is to have your child learn to speak and understand in French, then French immersion absolutely is the right program for them. Um, but if you also want your child to be biliterate, then they're going to require explicit systematic instruction in reading just as they would in, in the English program too. And switching your child from French immersion into English is not going to be a successful experience because they're still going to require that explicit systematic um, uh, structured literacy approach to reading. And I don't just phonics and phonemic awareness because I really want people to understand that the OHRC um, uh, recognizes that there's more to the reading process than just phonics and sound skills. But that was that was their focus for this particular inquiry. But um, kids who are struggling to read need it all. We need as teachers to keep all those balls in the air and um, and all those pieces of the puzzle together at the same time. Well, and the language comprehension component is not something that needs to be explicitly in the language arts program. You can work on language right. comprehension in all aspects of your program and have that exposure to those wonderful fairy tales and, you know, the narrative texts, the nonfiction texts in other components of your lesson. So... Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we tried to keep it to an hour, but weren't very successful. Uh, and I hope that some of you will reach out and join me on a connection call if you have any further questions or would like to potentially go live like uh, Kim and I have just done. So thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me.